to and thank you cool yeah let me go live oh try again oh okay give me a sec um give me a sec jim what is your role i help dominique organize all of this it's and, uh, um I'm an electrical and computer engineer. Uh, my background is in computer vision. Oh, and, wonderful. And that's that's what I've done as graduate research. Excellent. Oh, perfect. Yeah, today's internet is a little weird. Uh, let me just, oh, this is pretty live, right? Give me a sec. Let me click the button again. Okay. Uh, oops, something went wrong. Uh, 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 it's not allowing me to really do, I think there are some keys and something was not really being, give me. It's always, it's always tricky doing LinkedIn Live. Yeah, right. I mean, I set up already, but when I click, it says arrow refresh and I click arrow refresh. So it must be the, the internet problem. So uh, let me keep. Let, let me put the new key in and it will go live. It just, uh, there are some tech issues for the internet or some key issues. So feel free to, uh, Jim, feel free to uh, icebreaker and, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. So Chris, I, I was looking at the, the description for the event. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you have a very interesting background. Yes, I, I, you know, I'm happy to hear you work with uh, computer vision because it's the, uh, it's the place that I really have become to focus all my time uh -huh. and what, what events that's going to have with um, XR. But, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting background because I was, you know, born with the Navi OSC, yet was able to get enough education and a job and working in a uh, electric utility doing real time systems. So have a lot of computer experience. Um, and then now I've been able to turn that to taking that to see, you know, can we help people with low vision and blindness? So when, when you say you weren't able to see, I, can you explain that? Is it, are you totally blind or? Oh, uh, in the presentation, you'll see some of the slides will show you sort of what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, I have low vision. I'm, I'm legally blind, which means I test at a level that is considered blind. There's like 8 million uh, people in the country that are considered blind and 1 million have no vision at all. The other 7 million have some level of vision. And that's some of the things we'll talk about in the presentation. That it, you know, it's it's effectively functionally blind, but enough to kind of get clues and see things and not to make some things work out. But a lot of the times it's fumbling around trying to um, get. That's very interesting. We're trying to do. Um, and, and it's particularly impressive that you've been able to go into a field like computer vision. I, I wonder if that gives you additional insights because you have to sort of think about how the algorithms are going to work. And I'm hoping so. I'm hoping that I have a unique perspective because of the way I see yet having computer knowledge. Uh, working on real-time systems like SCADA systems and outage management systems are very similar to um, computer vision systems in the sense that they're real-time. You're taking in information, processing it, and then doing something with it, which is yeah. you know, exactly what I want to do um, in the XR space. Okay, uh, I, I think, think um, yeah, okay, I love great. the uh, conversation, uh, but we, since like uh, I reset it and it's is probably working. So um, yeah, that, 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 that's just go live uh, okay. and I will do introduction. Okay, let's do it. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris, for being our guest speaker today. And I will pass the baton uh, to Chris. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining. I am Chris McNally and um, I'm glad you're all joining today to hear about vision for the future, leveraging XR for enhanced accessibility. And I'm gonna be spending a lot of time explaining 
you know, what I mean by that and what I think we can all get out of it uh, to make XR better. I want to thank X Reality Pro for giving me the time to speak with their community. I'm going to be able to show you how I see and the tools that I use with XR. And I'm going to be able to talk about the experts that I've used over the last 10 years so that I've you know, watched their videos and looked at the streamers and the influencers and learn about XR and pure vision and how uh, people with low vision and blindness like myself will be able to um, enhance the world and use emerging technology to make the world easier to uh, operate within. But for me, a huge value is the discussion. So as I go through the slides, I'm really looking forward to giving you my perspective from a person who's blind and low vision and has some technology background. And so now is trying to use all that to help people uh, to better operate within the world. But it's really the discussion with you and all of your backgrounds. I mean, all of you are going to have expertise well beyond mine in the areas that you work in. And once you see what I'm struggling with, maybe you could have ideas about how I could better uh, do my work and bring to bear some of the ideas that you have. Um, and then answering your questions and um, at the end of the presentation sounds great. So let's see if I can go to the slide and change here. Okay. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk about how XR will revolutionize the way we interact with the world. How my lived experience creates the foundation for my work in XR. How much has evolved in the past decade and to celebrate the amazing future coming in the next years and decades related to XR. First, let's outline some key areas. XR is changing the world for everyone and for people with low vision and blindness. In any terms of not explaining, uh, I will get to eventually. I'm going to bring it in as a discussion. So what is low vision and blindness? What do I see? All of that I'll be explaining. Extended reality, or XR, will change how we interact with the technology. The digital and physical world will blend together. Virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality are redefining entertainment, education, industry, and communications, creating new opportunities for learning, playing, and working. XR opens doors to experiences beyond the constraints of physical space, enabling innovative approaches to creativity, collaboration, and exploration. As for supporting individuals with low vision and blindness, XR will be a powerful tool for enhancing accessibility and independence. The community will have new ways to perceive and interact with the environment, from providing audio guided navigation and spatial awareness in real world settings, to XR will provide new forms of learning, social interaction, and personal mobility. What people need greatly varies. You're going to hear it all from my perspective of a person that can't see and has low vision and blindness and how we can use technology to make it so I can operate in the world more smoothly uh, and fit in with society and, and, you know, be able to be my own guide and my own person that can operate without needing sighted guides or a blind cane or various other things that seeing eye does. The, what, I'll, what I'll show you is how I see, as an example, uh, this image here shows a room of tables, chairs, and couches, just as an example. The circle in the center can help demonstrate two common types of low vision, and there's many, many, many types. Where flexibility is basically the most important thing we could ever have, is devices and technology that are very flexible because there's so many variations. So low vision describes vision that's less than full vision. So people with full vision have full vision, people who have less than full vision have low vision. It's kind of a very broad term. Um, and it's vision that can't be corrected by glasses or contacts. And then blind refers to clinically testing at a level that's considered blind. So numbers I've read is that there's 8 million people in the country that are considered blind. 1 million have no vision, 7 million, like me, have varying forms of vision. Very low, very, very low compared to full vision. 
um, cause a lot of issues navigating and functioning within the world, but some amount of vision to be able to get some level of context. And I'll, I'll be able to show you examples of that. So some people like me see the best in the area of the small circle. When you think of this whole room, everything in it, all the detail, the best vision for people that have central vision and have issues with all the other vision um, would be in that, could be in that circle, some level of that circle, depending on how big the circle is, can also be a factor of their level of vision. Um, so I have central vision and limited other vision. Some people don't see what's in the small circle and see well, potentially the same as a person with full vision around that area. So that's just one of the interesting large groupings of people with low vision in that large group that, you know, some people can't see in that circle and some people can see in that circle and have a lot of issues around it. So I'm one of the people that can see in the little circle and not much around it. And so you'll be seeing examples of that as we go along. So having systems that are configurable and can adapt to people is just going to be the name of the game and, and so important. So being born with uh, what I have is retinitis pigmentosa or RP. I have low vision. I am legally blind. Um, I have a love for technology and all of that has shaped my drive for leveraging XR, which is why I love talking to folks like yourselves that are interested in XR and all the aspects of it. There's you know, so many aspects of XR, and every single one of them could be brought to bear to help with this situation that I'm talking about. Uh, working as a technology architect on real-time systems uh, for 32 years helped me learn to bridge the gap between competing groups and requirements. Um, so it's, it's amazing to me how moving into XR and computer vision is so similar in my mind to the work that I was doing before, working for electric utilities creating SCADA systems that control the electrical network and um, footage management systems that find out where the issues are in a system and, and gets the customer's back, power back, helps to uh, with that process. And all of that would be in real time. So the data would be coming in, you'd be processing it, and then you'd be doing something with it. And that's exactly what I want to do with computer vision and XR is the cameras can see the world in what is could be considered almost full vision a uh, hundred times better than me. And now what can we do with all that data to either express it to me in a way I can do non-visually or enhance the areas of my vision that do work and give it a lot of information there so I can use it. So it's just, it's amazing to me, the connection between a real-time system that's processing data for an outage for, and the same with processing data for vision. Uh, the two seem to have a really good connection from my perspective. Um, so, so applying this merging tech to assist people in the blind and low vision community uh, brings it all together for me at a time when the most change is happening. And one of the things I want to tell you about is what it was like when I was growing up, there was so little technology, it was amazing. And now there's so much technology and it's only accelerating faster and faster. So it's the perfect time to give awareness of what these challenges are and you know, have people help or make their systems extra configurable or whatever is needed. Um, so the last year has been really rewarding for me. I was a mentor and a judge at MIT Reality Hack, which was just an incredible experience. I was a speaker at the Assistive Technology Industry Association Conference, which is kind of the other side of the coin. It's, it's the group of people all over the country who are providing the services to people with low vision and blindness. So they help me out on a regular basis on my blind and low vision side. Um, and then I was able to be a speaker at AWE uh, 2023, which is, as many of you would know, is, is the other side, the technology side, and speak there about how technology and low vision and blindness come together. I was lucky enough to speak with Stan LaRoque from Lynx um, because one of the things you're going to see in this presentation is just how much the links has moved technology forward from my perspective and the things that I need and help me kind of look at what are the devices coming in the future that I continue could to use and make my vision better. And now speaking at X Reality Pro event, you know, so it's been just a great year. I really appreciate all the people that I've met and all the ideas they've given and, and all the people that are working in this space. 
that are going to help everybody in the world, but I find uh, are going to be helping people with low vision and blindness also. All right, so let's look at how I see. This is one of the first big examples where you get a little part of the layers uh, that make up my vision. So the first thing is called trinotopia, color blindness. It's also known as blue-yellow color. It's an extremely rare form of color blindness. The image on the left shows bright flowers and greenery. The image on the left should look as expected to a person with full vision. The image on the right is how I see. The flowers are missing colors, they're muted, and the greenery looks blue, gray, lifeless, so I'm told. Because the image on the right matches the colors exactly with the image on the left, I see both images as exactly the same. Most colors are confused, blue, green, red, purple, yellow, pink. And, you know, sort of amazes me, I, grew up in a family that had a big garden and I would work out in the garden all the time. And so there'd be tons of greenery and plants in different stages and lots of flowers. Uh, so I guess they're attracted to bees. Um, but it amazes me that with all of that going on, when I look at both of these pictures, they both look to me what I thought was the most beautiful field of green and flowers. And it kind of amazes me when I hear people's reactions to this picture. Um, the huge difference between what I'm seeing, what other people are saying, and even what I think of things as, what I think of a beautiful field of flowers and the brightest greenery I've ever seen, uh, and what that really looks like. It makes me just realize how all of us working on XR can really uh, work to understand, you know, how are all the different ways people are seeing things, and what are some of the ways that we can adjust it. Some of the newer headsets these days are starting to come out with, they would always have, have red-green colorblind, but they're actually starting to come out now with blue-yellow colorblind, which is amazing. Um, and when I turn it on, things that were muddled and mushed, mushed together, you know, become separated. So it's, I already see changes are coming in the industry that they're, they're looking to solve some of these things and I really appreciate it. Okay, so we're going to use this picture for the rest of the simulation. Um, so this is the baseline showing a kitchen um, as it would look to a person with full vision. Uh, it's a kitchen in an apartment. There's a walkway defined by counters. So there's, there's cabinets and walkways on the left. Um, there's a stove and a microwave straight ahead. There's a sink on the left. There's a very cluttered counter, which is going to become very important for the discussion. And then on the right is a very empty counter, which is also going to be important for the conversation. And then there's a refrigerator. So you're basically standing at the edge of a kitchen, you can walk straight ahead up to the stove, and then you take a right, you walk by the refrigerator, and you walk out to the rest of the apartment. And it'll just give us this basis of what I'm seeing uh, versus what other people see. Um, okay, so the second, after Trinitopia, the second thing that I have is, they call them floaters uh, in the medical community, but they call them dots, uh, salt and pepper pattern, heavy snow. Um, this image shows the addition of the floaters. They look like dots to me or dense snow. And if you think of people that drive down the highway in a snowstorm and it's very densely snowing and it just affects your entire vision. So that's, that's kind of what the dots are like. This header pattern of dots causes muddled views of the scene and it makes navigation and object avoidance difficult. So if you look at and people that I'll describe it for anyone on the line that can't see, but for People with full vision, you can see now on the left hand side that um, the objects were, were already cluttered, but now there's all these dots over them. And so it makes them even harder to figure out what they are. And even on the right hand side, where there's only a hot plate on an empty counter, um, all the dots just make it confused and muddled. What is there? I think it's empty, but I'm starting to not be sure. The next thing that I have is dimming or dark adaption. This image shows how my vision dims the scene. In well-lit areas, I estimate I have 20 to 40% of the view that other people have, like the information that comes to my eye, which only a small amount of it gets to me, only 20 to 40% of that is what a person with full vision can see. In medium lighting, this is a very bright light. I've added a ton of lights to this kitchen, so it's very bright. So this is like the best I could ever see just with the dots and the dimming. Um, with medium lighting, so the way this kitchen was lit before I added all the lights, 
I can only see 5% of full vision. And anything below when the lights are off, um, and I know I see people with full vision go into the kitchen all the time and operate, you know, I see nothing uh, at all. So it's the lighting is very important. Contrast is very important. And unfortunately, the dots and the dimming take away uh, both brightness and contrast. So navigation object detection becomes even more difficult. All right, the fourth and the funnest one is the donut or acute central ring scotoma. The image adds the donut. The donut splits my vision into three areas. The circle in the middle, the donut hole, um, has my central vision. And it's where everyone's central vision is, but it has what I have of central vision, which is a very small amount compared to uh, full vision. But my best vision is in this little circle in the center um, inside the donut. The ring that is the donut, so there's a large ring around the center that there's no vision. And vision goes out from center vision is where everyone sees the best. And then as you move out from there, you have less and less resolution, but your brain uh, factors that all in. So that when you look at something, you feel like you're just seeing it, um, even though you're really just seeing what you're looking at directly. And the other things are all kind of fading away, but your brain just makes you comfortable with that. And um, so with me, all I have is that little bit of center and then nothing, and then some peripheral vision out around the edges. I left the peripheral vision in, but really to use the simulator, but for people with full vision, if you, if you put your face close to the screen so that you're really just looking at the dot of the central vision, and the donut should be blocking most of your vision, and then right out of the edges, you have very unusable, the usual, you know, everyone has peripheral vision that goes out so wide, you're only seeing movement there. You're not really seeing any details. Um, if you wanted to read a sign or do anything detailed, if you turn your head, and start using your central vision uh, to view it. So the interesting thing is I perceive the entire field of view as if I can see uh, limited, but no missing areas. So the really weird thing is that I don't see the donut. So it just looks like the previous picture with all the dots and the dimming. Uh, but I need to be really careful because I'm not seeing in those areas. So I could be walking along and a cabinet door could be open. I would just walk right into it because it would be in the donut. And my brain would be filling in an image using kind of all the pieces around and just fill it in and make me feel like I'm looking at a kitchen. But really what's in there, I'm not really seeing a, a person, a door, you know, an open cabinet or a drawer. And I would not see it all I would just walk into. All right, so on the left side is the view with full vision. On the right is the best I ever see. Um, with, and this is the best I ever see in brightly lit. So like outside sunlight or very brightly lit indoor, and then it drops down from there. We're pretty quickly going to no vision at all if things are not well lit. Um, all of the elements combined to form my final vision. The image on the right shows all the layers combined. Uh, this is how my see. This is how my eyes see the world, and again, I just need to be really careful walking around. Um, times in my life that I've noticed people that I've seen the difference between what I'm seeing with other people seeing. When in high school, I was running late, coming back from the gym, and I get back to the hallway, and every, all the classes have started, so the hallways are empty. And I'm at my locker, and I'm using a flashlight on my uh, combination lock, and it's ambient daylight, you know, with windows and everything in the normally lit high school hallway that I'm sure everyone else would think is normal lighting, easy to function in. For me, it's just way too dark. And so I'm using a flashlight shining it on my lock combination. And all of a sudden I hear this voice, someone must have got a hallway pass. And I just hear a voice that says, is it dark in here? And it just really struck me, the difference, you know, what it would look like. It would make a great meet of a person in a lit hallway with a flashlight trying to open a combination. Um, it just shows how you're almost in an alternate reality from what everybody else is experiencing. Okay, um, now let's look at how things have changed over the past decade. So this is kind of my decade uh, journey that I've been on back, I don't even think they called it XR back then, but 
you know, to look at these technologies, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and now extended reality kind of coming over all of them, uh, but just how it's progressed for me. And this is one, still one of my favorite pictures. It's what I created 10 years ago, but I left it. I didn't add the dots and the other things and the donut and the things I've kind of learned. I've left it in this form because uh, it really still shows one of the key elements that got me started in all this, you know, over 10 years ago. Uh, when I look through my smartphone, I have a modern smartphone that has a good camera and a bright screen. My current cell phone has a thousand nits. And it's so bright and wonderful uh, that it really makes a huge difference. That when I look through it, I see way better than I do with my eyes alone. Um, it reduces the dots and the dimming. And the donut is still there, but it gets a lot of the information I need into a small space uh, right in front of me with a much better view of the world. So it amazed me that I could look through my cell phone at a scene, like that same kitchen, the lights were off. If I looked through my cell phone, I would see a much better image of the kitchen and what I was dealing with than I would if um, I was just looking at my own eyes, I wouldn't be seeing anything. So it really struck me. Um, so in this image, you know, I, I can't see anything on the table. I'd be knocking over glasses and everything. I can't see that the chair is pulled out or I would run into that. All the context is lost. Um, you know, I potentially would know we came to a restaurant, we're going to eat. So I didn't have an inkling of the kind of things I'd be running into. But, you know, I'd be feeling around for the chair. I mean, felt the chair. I'd assume the table, you know, is going to be in front of it and then start feeling around for silverware and things like that. Um, on the right, the image is just so much better, incredibly enhanced. Even with my low vision, I can now see the silverware on the table and where the plate was beginning, and I can see the menu. I can see the menu enough to use my central vision, and if it's black and white, if it's a high contrast, you know, I could have a better chance of reading it than uh, with my eyes alone. So the Contest is lost. My brain turns blobs into other things on the left. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how the phone allows me to use my full available vision. It magnifies the existing light. My camera has low light capabilities and the screen is really bright. And that just makes um, such a huge difference. One thing that I find myself doing, I, I don't know whether this has changed or it's just me, but Movies are too dark now. Movie theaters, I keep needing to go to a movie theater and, and offer to have a like host a night for people with low vision and blindness where once a month or whatever they have, they have a top movie that where they turn up the brightness on the projector because I really cannot see movies in movie theaters. But even at home, watching Netflix and things like that, the scenes are so dark now. Like there's so many scenes where I guess they're creating mood with darkness and it's just so dark. But I find if I can watch the show through my phone, I can um, see it much better. And there are some products out uh, these days that are starting to do that, where they pipe the signal through a pair of uh, VR glasses and they, they give you that view. Um, so I really do think that that's helping a lot of people and, and things are starting to work in that direction. Um, okay, so the, all right, so my thought was, all right, so I looked through my phone and there's these great glasses that are starting to come out 10 years ago. And I looked at my phone and I can see better. So how hard would it be to put that into, you know, glasses? I mean, that should be really easy, right? So 10 years later, I think we're all struggling with the fact of just how complicated the optics, uh, the lenses, um, getting to the resolution, you know, in any way getting close to human vision, to be able to show human vision and enhance human vision. And then people with full vision could take that in, or people with low vision would get the best they can get out of it. Um, so it, it's been, it's been a, the 10 years have been amazing to see how it's changed over time. Um, and I think things are accelerating and hopefully more and more will come over the next five and 10 years. Uh, but it is amazing how it's, the technology is almost at the edge of what's possible and we're pushing it out. Um, and I can't wait to get to that point where it really, you know, is a point where it's easier to deliver these types of things. Um, all right, so what I looked at was tracking tech over the years. I've been looking at how it changes. Companies have been struggling with creating the perfect device. It's technically not possible today. Um, it would just be too expensive. 
take too many resources, too much time. And in many cases, uh, some of the experts think that it's just physically impossible. Like we need to have some breakthroughs of technology to continue to deliver components that'll get down to you know, human level um, screens that have propagated rendering and they have variable focus and they have all the things the human eye does. It's just gonna take a little while of a strong believer we are gonna get there. Uh, so looking at the key devices that I've looked at over the years uh, for augmented reality, where you have a pair of glasses, like my pair of glasses, you're looking through them and, and there's a square in front of you where the computer can paint information. For that type of scenario, um, I started out with the Epson Move area, which uh, would be able to, you know, I write applications and have code and have images up in front of me. I could uh, have what the camera was seeing come up on a window in front of me. It was out of context of reality, but at least it showed me what was in front of me. And I could see the image that it put up there better than I could see the, um, the real world. So I was starting to get that feel of my camera my face where I could see what is seeing hands-free, you know, started to get there. Then the Microsoft HoloLens came out, so I was working with that, and that same thing, square information through a clear glass where you're looking at the real world that's painting something over it. But the, and then the Unreal Air uh, glasses were the original from Unreal, which now has become Xreal. Um, but all three of these, the biggest issue I'm having with them, until I figure out how to do local dimming, at a level that could emulate um, kind of a view of the human eye. It's gonna be the mixed reality stuff that come around the last couple of years has become very popular. That is definitely working better because when you're looking through at the real world and it's painting over it, if there's light coming in from the side or there's all different things that can happen that mess up the image of that for me and, and no longer give me an immersive experience. Now with um, mixed reality, that has really started to solve that problem uh, with the MetaQuest Pro uh, and then with the Lynx device, I was able to get an immersive environment that could show the scene in front of me because its cameras were seeing what was there and add computer components to it. But the cool thing was light coming in the slide and everything was not affecting. You really were getting a full controlled environment, which was really something that I, I need to do. Um, and the, the links made me realize how important brightness is and contrast. Uh, MetaQuest Pro, the screens were pretty dim. Uh, the Lynx screens are much brighter. And that's when I started to realize things were really important to have that uh, capability. So the Lynx was totally groundbreaking for me because everything I tried before it worked a little bit, but not, not completely. It's the first device that brightens the world, like my smartphone. It's the first one that I look through, and it's, it's like looking through my smartphone, getting those benefits of brightening up the image. Many devices have pancake lenses, I'm sure many of you know. And it's a wonderful technology for slimming the headset, uh, but it causes, every time the light goes back and forth, it, it cuts the brightness of the hat, is my understanding. And I definitely see the effects of it. So the MetaQuest Pro, has with pancake lenses, like most devices with pancake lenses, has 100 nits of brightness as a measurement of light that comes through from the screen. My understanding is the human eye sees 20,000 nits of brightness, and the MetaQuest Pro has 100 nits of brightness, and most devices with pancake lenses, my understanding is they have the same. The Lynx has a special lens design that allows 450 nits of brightness through. And so this is where I started to realize that Brightness is just so important to me. I need at least 400 nits to be able to see the world better than I see it with my own eyes. And so as devices get better, um, you know, the Apple Pro device, they're talking about having 500 or 1,000 nits. You know, my cell phone has 1,000 nits. I'm really thinking that if devices start having 500 and greater, it's going to make just a huge difference. But the first time I saw it uh, was with the Lynx, getting that high contrast, uh, creating that distinction between objects and then just brightening it enough so my eyes can actually see it. Another benefit of uh, these devices like the Lynx is that it has the two cameras, so you get stereo vision, and it has a field of view that's aligned with 
reality. So you're looking at the screen, the screen's going across your field of view, and at the point that it ends, your peripheral vision picks up and you see the rest of the world. So it's a really smooth environment where after wearing it for a little bit, you forget you're even wearing it because you feel like you're just looking with your own eyes because it's matched so perfectly. And then it's also matched with reality um, from a perspective of perfect, from a perspective of where objects are. So everything is aligned. So once you're wearing it, so when I put it on, I now see better than I did before. And I can reach out and grab something on the table that potentially I didn't even see at all. The luckily a year ago, I happened to be in um, Paris for an anniversary, and I just we sent a note to uh, the Lynx company and, and said, "Oh, we heard about your web, you know, hear about your device, and it sounds like it's going to produce great uh, results for me, just having the world be brighter, and I'd love to see it." And uh, they got back to me, and I was able to get a meeting with uh, Stan LaRoque and some of his team. And it was, it was amazing. Again, it would be make a great short video of me walking in with my cane, not being able to see tables and chairs, having difficulty sitting down, figuring out the orientation of an office chair and how to sit down on it. And so they see me coming across with my cane and they see me having trouble and everything. And then I put on the links and I put down my cane and I can stand up, walk around the room, not bumping into anything, picking up objects off the table that I couldn't see before. So it was absolutely amazing that the people that were there were just staring at me with their mouths hung open, which is amazing because it's the first time I can really see people's faces enough to see that that's what was happening. Um, but it's just amazing. I was shaking hands, seeing people's expressions. It was incredible to have the brightness enough to then get that little bit that I get out of vision uh, from it. It's a great combination. Um, so it's uh, that was amazing, and I can't wait for more and more devices that are brighter and have wider field of view, and you know continue to expand on this. So this is the view of the kitchen uh, without the links. So this is this is how I perceive my vision. This is what I feel like I'm seeing, even though you can imagine the donuts there, and so I'm not really seeing what's there. But this is what it feels like to me when I on the links, I'm showing this as full vision. So you're anyone seeing it with their own vision. So if you have a full vision, you're seeing a full vision. But what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, from my perspective, just like the flowers being the most beautiful flowers I've ever seen, even though apparently they, I'm not seeing them that way. Uh, this is similar that, you know, I'm seeing this with my best vision. I have the donut, I might have some dots and some dimming, but I'm seeing something that uh, really looks the best to me and lets me interact with the world to the best I can purely from a visual perspective. In a second, we're going to talk about all the other ways that can help with non-visual. But you know, from a visual perspective, for someone that has low vision, getting them the best image they can so they can use what they can from it um, would make just a huge difference. So just to show you, though, this is, this is what I have to remember really seeing is that even when I have my best vision, you know, and I can now see across the kitchen to the controls and the clock on the stove. Um, but I just have to be careful to know that, even though I feel like I'm seeing everything better, I actually am only seeing that little area better. So now, now this is where things are really cool because for ten, over 10 years, I've wanted to just brighten the scene. You know, now with the links and, and future devices that are coming sound like they're going to start having much higher resolution, much better um, optics with brightness and contrast and everything. So it sounds like I feel like that is really starting to come into its own. So now I've been turning my attention the last couple of years to all the other cool things that are going on at XR. And I look forward to hearing all of your uh, feedback of the different things you're working on and how it might be able to be brought to bear. Uh, but adding object identification and avoidance has always been one of my most important things. And I kind of feel like we're starting to see uh, the ability to plan a safe path uh, without a lot of safety. We're able to see that that kind of technology where you look at a scene, I'll, I'll use OpenCV uh, for Unity and Unity, and I'll hook up a camera and I can point it at the kitchen and it will identify the objects in the room. And that, that's just amazing. And then 
doing it with AI is even more amazing. AI can just look at the kitchen and identify the objects and not even run all the procedures and parameters uh, that are trying to figure out what the objects are. It just looks at it and uses all the knowledge that it has to just know that it's a microwave or a refrigerator or how far away it is. So there's a lot of amazing things coming as we take, now that the scene is a little better, now the camera can work with that and see you know, what are the benefits that can be brought to bear for people with low vision and blindness. Uh, so everything about working in the kitchen, navigating around, uh, work, walking around the apartment would be easier and safer if, when you think of the view with the donut, if the camera and the system knew where things were, it could then put information in the areas where I have better vision and have indications. So I'm looking at the microwave, direct me there, um, point me in that direction, uh, tell me about any obstacles that might be in the way of going there. So another cool thing that's going on is depth perception. When you merge object avoidance and identification with depth perception, so now it knows how far away it is, you really see how you get to where you start having a sighted guide that can see the world fully and could help bring it to a person that uh, needs that information. So it adds important details. Uh, this is an example of Midas AI creating a depth map. Um, my plan is to take the links and OpenCV. I already have OpenCV identifying objects with AI. I'm um, adding depth so that now I could place either my own objects that are more visible, higher contrast at the same locations, or I could use it to, you know, I could tie into AI and ask it, what, do, what is it seeing? Or how can I, what's the best route to get to the um, microwave? So there's a lot of things that once the camera can see better, the camera can identify the objects and make paths around it. And it knows how far away things are, whether it's using the stereo cameras or uh, just using AI to determine that. It gives a lot of capabilities that uh, could then be transferred over to the person. So, uh, so directing a person to an item, uh, it amazes me how AI can do that. Um, the depth within the image, the map, uh, looks at the sheets. Uh, so, okay, so the so this picture kind of looks like um, sheets have been thrown over everything. But it makes, it is really amazing to me that the, the color tone of the sheets is directly, you know, related to how far things away are. So things that are brighter or closer, things that are dimmer or farther away. And looking at the picture of the real kitchen and standing in the kitchen and knowing what the depths are and everything, it amazes me how much you can, you know, ascertain using AI and other methods to know, you know, the scene that it's looking at. And at this point, it just seems like there's so many possibilities of being able to help someone uh, with this kind of understanding of where things are, what their shape is, what their distance is. Um, definitely something uh, that's going to be very helpful. All right, eventually we'll have XR and AI sighted guides. Examples can be seen today. There's an app called Be My Eyes that has a new app um, version of themselves called Be My AI. There's another app called Sightwise. And these both um, use the camera to get an image of what's in front of the person and then describe, and uh, knowing that a person's uh, low vision or blind, describe the scene to them. So you can already see apps are starting to move in that direction. Uh, there's another app called Clue that provides amazing navigation inside and outside. And so this is another thing. I could see putting all these apps together. The app that has AI and knows the scene, the app that can navigate you where you want to go. Uh, there's, a, there's another product called the Glide that's a robot that a person has in front of them, and it can see what's in front and do um, navigation and object avoidance, uh, things like that. So. So as I started adding these things up, I realized we put all these pieces together. You're going to end up with something that could really help people, that they could be wearing, that could help enhance whatever vision they have, but it could also give them information in other ways uh, to make it better. 
So the um, one of the things that's amazing is the multimodal AIs that have just become very popular. Really, in the last couple of months, have they just really blossomed and become widely available to everybody? But by merging the language models that we've all been working with for a year with vision and audio and other capabilities in this multimodal way, it is starting to make it that you can just point the you know camera at something and the AI will be able to experience all those elements of it and help in all the ways that uh, you'd expect given that information. So chat GDP, BARD, and others can be used to you know view the world, describe it, um, give it the enhanced enhanced functionality and navigation, you know, with object avoidance that all becomes possible as it can experience the world in that many ways. So with a paid ChatGTP account, it's possible to create your own GPTs, just as an example of this topic. I created one called Cited Guides. When I went into ChatGTP, I created my own GPT called Cited Guide. I spent some time chatting with it, giving it configuration instructions so we could understand what it's like to be blind and low vision and, and really what, what my blindness and low vision is like. And then in this picture, and then I said to it, okay, this is an image of what's in front of me. And it's amazing to me that it was able to uh, describe the hallway, uh, identify uh, the obstacles that were in it. Um, it went on to talk about how I could clear the obstacle by how to walk up to it safely and, and move it and everything. But this is just a small example of it that, you know, a couple months ago I tried this and it didn't work. And now, a couple months later, I try it and it, and it almost worked perfectly right out of the box. Really, really impressed. And it makes me wonder, is we're only a year into major consumer uh, AI, and I just think of where in a year, three years, I mean, this will continue to become you know, a great way to assist people that need that additional information. Okay, so one of the things I learned from working with uh, computer systems and with all the customers is uh, the idea of bridging the gap of kind of between what, what people need and what can be delivered at a, at a certain given time. At the top of the slide is just an image of a bridge. On the left side, uh, there's a low vision community. Talking to people with their lived experience is critical, knowing the community that you're going to be providing for. Uh, people who care and provide services for them need to be included. And all the stakeholders uh, are all just key to ensuring all the needs are captured. So as we go out and work with all the various communities, including the low vision and blind community, we can have the knowledge of where are the challenges and what are the things that uh, would make it better. And then in the center, is where we is what we used to do at work is uh, we come up with all the requirements and then we do the design. And so in the center under the bridge is the info we need to collect identifying the needs of the community, but then rolling it into uh, requirements and technical drivers, which is how we can bridge the gap between a community that has needs and, and wants certain things and a group of people that could actually deliver it like yourselves that are doing XR and know the technology, know how to deliver applications and capabilities. And by merging those two together, we can define the requirements, give them to the people that are innovating and uh, performing the work. I mean, it amazes me when I was talking to Stan LaRoque at the Lynx offices and well, for one, he was like, you know, we didn't build this for people who couldn't see. We had no idea that it would have this effect. So it's amazing to see it operate in that way. But then this next thing was, if you could tell us, you know, if you could tell us what would make this better for someone like yourself and others, uh, they would work with us. And, and what I've been finding is that I've gone to a lot of different conferences, talked to a lot of technical groups, and I keep finding that same just amazing amount of openness of people wanting to help. And, uh, you know, they're building this product. They want it to be successful. If they can make it in a way that actually helps a person see that couldn't see before, I mean, to them, that, that seems to be extremely satisfying. And I, I really appreciate that. All right, so next we're going to look at the future. So we've looked at kind of how I see, and then we looked at, um, the road that I kind of took, I think I've been over half the last 10 years. And now what looked really bright to me is the future and where we're going. 
advances in XR and AR are going to change um, how assistance is provided to people with low vision and blindness, delivering greater independence and additional safety and mobility. Um, when I was growing up in the 70s, uh, all we had was like dimly lit flashlights. And so you would, you would have this dim little circle of light right in front of you, and that was it. You know, I think it did more for people with low vision, but for me, it was just extremely limited. You could only shine it on something very specifically and hope that it would brighten it enough to be able to see it. It was not very impressive. It was not very helpful. Incredible progress has been made through the decades, and it only appears to be accelerating and getting better. And let's look at some of the things we could do with all this technology to make it even better. So one thing is I'm waiting for the Apple Vision Pro, the um, and the visor. These are the two devices I'm tracking the closest. I, I look at all the devices. I watch all the YouTube channels that talk about the devices. And I'm putting together a spreadsheet to try to explain why you know they're all amazing. They're all incredible. I cannot believe what people are creating today. And they all have great capabilities. But for meeting my needs, you know, it limits them down a lot. Like, for instance, most of them have pancake lenses, uh, which only has 100 nits of brightness. Uh, but the, the two that are looking very promising are the Apple Vision Pro, which I know, I know we want to mass produce and get the price way down so that um, it becomes affordable. Setting that aside, purely from a technology perspective, you know, it is supposed to have very bright displays, uh, very high resolution displays. All of that will be very beneficial uh, for moving this forward. And then the visor, I've seen a few things about it. It's really looking promising with its resolution. And I'm, if I'm understanding this correctly with the information that you put out, it looks like another device that might be bright enough, high enough contrast, high resolution cameras to show the real world. And um, again, could move us uh, closer to something. Uh, with high resolution, pixel density, future devices will continue to improve. Okay, so another big area of that's going to help is spatial audio. It can simulate real world sounds in a 3D space, helping visually impaired individuals navigate their environment more effectively. Audio cues can indicate the direction of traffic, the proximity of obstacles, or the location of doorways and stairs. XR spatial audio can facilitate better communications by simulating the spatial positioning of people in a virtual environment. This can make it easier for visually impaired users to understand who's speaking in a group setting and uh, the direction from which the sound is coming. This will enhance social interaction and collaboration. Spatial audio technology can aid in everyday tasks. It boils down to getting a sense of the environment from a source other than vision. Uh, making this transfer information intuitive will be critical. So, you know, so now the camera can see everything and you can't see it visually. There are all the different ways you could get it to people and spatial audio is definitely one of them. When I was a mentor and a judge at MIT Reality Hack, uh, one of the projects there that was absolutely incredible was called Ben Vision. And I see them a lot on LinkedIn. They're doing really well. And uh, but they came up with a scenario that you would put on a headset, it could see the world, and it would it would give you navigation instructions to let you navigate between a space. And so if you're just walking along, you're navigating, you're doing these normal sounds, very typical sounds from a computer. Uh, but what it would do is if you saw something beautiful, a picture or the Grand Canyon or something, it would describe it in just a crescendo of an orchestra of um, spatial music. And it was it was a chilling, I mean, I still just talking about it gives me chills because it's so weird to have so little visual information coming in, but to have vision sparks to sound that turns like the blips of uh, walking along a path to seeing something and having it described in this vibrant audio was, was just a, you know, experience that uh, really struck me and got me thinking, you know, more and more in this direction of how much could be brought to people, whether it's basic about navigation or whether it's, you know, who they're looking at, uh, what they're looking at, the beauty in the world. 
Uh, it's amazing that that will begin, you know, giving more information to what is mostly a void uh, for me today. Let's see. Okay, another is haptic feedback. Uh, this can guide users through physical spaces by providing vibrations or other tactile signals. These signals can indicate directions, alert users to obstacles or hazards, and help with spatial orientation in unfamiliar environments. Haptics uh, can make digital interfaces more accessible by providing physical feedback. Vibrations or pressure changes can indicate when a user has activated a button, a touch screen, or navigate to a specific item in a menu. Enhancing the overall user experience, uh, Haptic will be able to offer you know, customized versions of this. So again, it just comes back. I, I don't like the word customize. I think we used to not like that at work because when you said customize, it's very expensive. But when you said configurable, it was like, I would be like, oh yeah, yeah, configurable. So I would like it to be configurable that um, that if you have full vision, you don't need any of the extras, it's off. But if you need things, you pull them in, whether it's visual related, audio related, whatever, you can bring in those components. You can definitely see apps moving in that direction of having more configuration. And as we make the requirements known and we let the people know that are building the apps, you know, more and more of these things become available. Okay, so again, at MIT Reality Hack, there was another project that had a backpack with gloves that you could wear. And same stunning experience as the Ben Vision with the um, audio. This one was tactile. So I was standing in a room with a group of people and I couldn't see anything. It was way too dark on the floor of this show. And there was lots of people, lots of companies were there and everything was just too dimly lit. And I put on this backpack and I put on these gloves, haptic gloves, and using a camera and feeding the information to the gloves, they were able to make it so that I could feel things that were maybe a foot, foot and a half in front of me. So I could feel a wall, a table, I could feel it, even though it was far away, you know, it was far away from me. I wasn't touching it, but it felt like I was touching it. And that sensation of interacting with the environment and getting the input of what was there, uh, again, you know, when you, it's hard to imagine, but when there's a total void information, if I have maybe 5% of the information that other people have visually. I have a lot of brain space that's kind of hanging around waiting for other stuff. And so these things really just give me shivers because it's like all of a sudden my brain fills with all this information that I didn't have before. And there's just so much opportunity with XR and all the technologies to um, you know, be able to deliver that experience to a wide group of people. Okay, so another is robot sighted guides. So I'm kind of layering these together. So all the things I saw with the links and all the things I see with brightening and depth and object detection and avoidance and AI and everything is all coming together. So then the glide is kind of getting at this too, the idea that you know equipped with sensors, a robot can detect obstacles in the path and guide a person around them, ensuring a safe and smooth navigation. By planning optimal routes and guiding the user through them, the robot can assist in reaching destinations effectively and safely, no following. Uh, this can include indoor and outdoor navigation. Robots can assist with household chores, identifying items, and performing tasks that require visual identification. Robots could facilitate access to information, enabling new education and employment opportunities through assistive technologies. There's multiple projects. It's so funny because a year ago, my wife and I were talking about this, and I said, you know, wouldn't it be great if it was like a, a robot seeing eye dog? You know, and seeing eye dogs are wonderful, uh, but if you are in a scenario where maybe you can't have one for some reason, uh, the benefits they offer are just massive. And if you could have a dog, a uh, robot that acts just like a seeing eye dog, uh, that would really enhance people's lives uh, to be able to give that kind of capability and you know, advanced navigation and, and knowledge and to do that with a, with a robot, where it's a biped robot that puts his hand on your shoulder and gently, you know, pushes forward to tell you that it's okay to walk across the street or whatever form it takes. Uh, the fact that you can see better and turn that into something usable is going to help a lot. All right, so now we're going to get into a section where I'm going to talk about my, uh, some of the groups that I've used to get where I am. 
I'm going to start with the X Reality Pro, since we've all found ourselves through this awesome group of people. Um, the Meetup group is awesome. I want to get more involved with a lot of the events that I see going. Um, you're building a community. You're all working with each other and helping each other, and that just is what is going to get us there. It's not going to be working in a, in a vacuum. It's going to be working with a lot of people and sharing these kind of experiences. But what I wanted to do is show you some of the other places that I've used to uh, build up my skills over the last 10 years. And, and maybe you know them all, maybe there's one or two you don't. And so if you just a chance, you know, I highly recommend going out and seeing the videos and learning about the communities. And uh, I think it'd be really, you know, nice for everybody to just keep learning and expanding. Um, okay. So the, one big thing that I'm not sure how many any of you have ever had to work with before, because this is more specific, and many of these are specific to the blind and low vision community, but it'd be a great way, <clears throat> you know, a lot of communities have the companies that assist them, they have uh, YouTube bloggers and everything that talk about the uh, community. So it's just a great way to learn about all the different kind of people there are and how we can build things so that it works for everybody. Uh, these organizations provide various forms of support and resources to assist people who have low vision and blindness. They create more inclusive and accessible societies. They offer resources for education, technology, career development, and advocacy to support the blind and visually impaired community. They work on enhancing the independence, security, equality, and opportunity um, of life for people who are blind and, and low vision. They advocate and educate. Uh, they talk about the technology projects. I, I don't spend a lot of time on the current technology. There's a ton of current cool technology for people who are blind and low vision. And it's getting better and better all the time. Um, I, I really like emerging technology and new things are coming. And I don't see a lot of people focusing on that, the emerging technology for blind and low vision. Uh, but I do see a lot of great people and a lot of great products working on today. Uh, my goal is to, with my technology experience, is to get together with all the people who are just leading the charge on this amazing technology and our little space uh, to see if um, we can also get it so it works well uh, for people like myself. Okay, so one is Carry On Accessibility. Uh, it's a website that offers a variety of resources, including information about the latest technology relevant to accessible guidance. Uh, talks about various accessibility features on devices, so how to use your smartphone or TVs or whatever. Uh, insights on accessibility, new technology products. It's a great way to learn about and understand the challenges experienced by the community. So, you know, people who have low vision and blindness will watch Carrie to get great ideas of how we can improve our life. Uh, but if you, other people could watch it to learn, you know, what are the challenges, what you know, what about this technology? It's a really high-end cell phone, you know, well, smartphone, but it doesn't work, you know, for some reason. So it'd be interesting to see what are the challenges, what are the different things that people need to think about when they're building, you know, completely open technology that everybody can use. Uh, this is just an example. I want to show a couple of these that just to show, even looking at a website or YouTube or whatever, that same thing with the donut. And again, if you you put your face like eight inches away from the donut. You get it to where you're kind of looking through the center of the donut, and then the donut kind of fills most of your other vision. That's that's pretty much what it is. And I leave the peripheral view of the website mostly for context, so you can see what the page looks like all around. But again, when you're in that mode where you're looking through the donut, there's really no usable peripheral vision, especially when you're reading a website. There's no usable peripheral vision. Another person is called The Blind Life, created by Sam. He has a deep understanding of assistive devices and living techniques for low vision. He offers various forms of support and resources for the visually impaired community. Sam shares his personal experiences in providing tips and tricks for navigating life with low vision. He also showcases new assistive technology and provides product reviews. Sam has a very comprehensive site of all vision loss. It's just a great way to stay in touch with the technology and the people using it and how it can be improved. And uh, I just can't thank you know, Carrie and Sam enough for what they do in the community. 
now we're gonna get a little technical. Um, I some of my work that I've been doing for the last ten years. Um, I'm gonna start with my the easier side. That you know, depending on who's here with us today, uh, some of you might be designers, some of you might be coders. Um, if any of you wanted to dabble, that's one of the things I, I like being kind of a jack of all trades, where I do a little bit of everything. And I work with the experts in those verticals to get all the best out of it. But I like to tie things across a lot of areas. There's a couple of things I've found that could just help people. You know, people who are experts in coding and do all this this will not be new. Uh, but maybe there's some other people out there that want to try it. And you know, the technology is definitely getting to the point where you can prototype and try a lot of these things yourself, where it was very complicated you know, 20 years ago. Um, so let's look at some uh, development tools for XR development. I use Python to develop the images simulating my vision. I use it to develop computer vision and artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions. I use computer vision libraries like OpenCV for real-time object detection and recognition. I can use it for brightening the picture. I can really do it. There's almost anything with vision. It's amazing. Um, machine learning libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch. I'm learning all of these along with everybody else and just the general AI to see how much can that help and be brought to bear. Um, Python is just a really quick and easy way to prototype complex emerging technology. It's probably the quick, quickest, simplest way to get started. And I think my next one, okay, I'm just showing the donut. So when I'm doing coding, this is just to show, coding has the same issue. I need, I see so little of the screen that I'm constantly scanning, scanning along the lines, scanning to try to find. So I come up with all these tricks where I'll use, you know, I'll use find to get to the right section of the code, or I'll make comment sections that are really big. So when you're scrolling along, they're very really obvious. Um, but then even when I get to the code, I'm looking at a very small, this is why reading so hard. Coding is difficult because it's you're just looking at a small amount of information at a time. And so my brain is just filled with all the code that I've written on things because it's more about memorization than it is about uh, visual. Um, but back to um, back to Python. So it's one of the easiest ways to get started, but the easiest way to get started with Python is using something like Google Collab. Uh, Google Collab lets you be out in the cloud with all of the components that you need to as if you install the software and configured it on your computer and you have the right computer that has all the right hardware that you need to do it. You can get rid of all that. I mean, I love it. If you have the capability, do it. Uh, but if you don't, it's so easy. If you want to just prototype, to jump out to Google Cloud. They have this concept called notebooks and everybody shares their notebooks and you can get them, you can see the big projects on GitHub and, and everything. And so you can easily find um, ways to get started with computer vision and AI ML applications. It has zero setup. Uh, Google Cloud runs in the cloud. It's uh, free access to GPUs and TPUs at their base level. They, as you run things that are more complicated, they have levels where you can buy into um, buying more CPU and GPU. Uh, but at the simplest level, there's so much you can do. Um, it's easy sharing and collaboration. You can often find a notebook that had whatever it is, like for instance, uh, this Midas thing. I mean, within 15 minutes, I was able to get a notebook that does Midas, drop my picture in, run it. And first, you always have to check them to make sure there's no malicious code or anything, but it's like if you get it off of GitHub and from a reputable source and you look through it um, and you know what it's doing, you can run it and go pretty quickly from having a picture of the kitchen to having a picture of the kitchen with depth. And it's just a great way to get a feel for when new technology comes out, something brand new, AI is doing something it's never done before. You can often find that you can find a notebook and just run it yourself and see it and play around with it and make changes to it, use it for your own purposes. It's um, really a great way to do it. Makes Python prototyping faster, has everything you need all baked in. Uh, you can immediately start working with complex technology. Uh, get it up and running quickly. Okay, so more complicated, but my current favorite environment is Unity Develop. Uh, Unity, Unity Development allows the creation of rich, immersive environments that can simulate real world situations. Developers can create 
interactive simulations. Applications developed in Unity can be deployed across various platforms, including smartphones, VR headsets, and computers. Unity has a large community of developers and a vast ecosystem of assets. So you can find code examples. You can find people that can help you with what you're coding. You can find assets, which are um, the components that make up the various pieces of an application. So if you had a table, it could be an asset with a lot of components that is a table. And then the table, you can just go out and get a table and drop it into your scene. So it's vis very visually oriented. When I do the Python, it's more coding. It's pretty straightforward coding. So if you like, you know, if you're interested in getting into coding, it's a pretty straightforward way to learn it. But with Unity, it's more of a graphical environment, like almost a paint program where you're dropping 3D objects and able to interact with them. As it gets more complicated, there's C sharp programming. So um, and that is a higher level of programming. So uh, you would need to learn if you don't know it already. You need to learn uh, C. Um, our programming uh, to be able to do Unity fully, but it is a great way to be able to prototype 3D environments uh, pretty quickly. Uh, significantly speeds up development is one of the things that's amazing. What, what used to take thousands of lines of code, you now can just drag some pieces together, add a little bit of code. So even when you're scripting in this, you're scripting like less than 100 lines for you know things that do really cool things. Um, it has support for solving complex problems. Uh, the Unity engine uh, allows for radiographic prototyping, which means ideas can be tested uh, very quickly. And it allows people to get to cross-platform devices. So all those, all those systems that I showed that I work with, all the headsets, I was able to use Unity from, for over 10 years and create applications and then move them from one headset to the next. So because it can create applications for Windows, it can work with the HoloLens, it can do Android, so it can do uh, the Lynx and um, a lot of the other ones are Android. Uh, the MetaQuest Pro, it can, it can do that. So it's, um, it's a great way to create capabilities in a relatively simple way by having the graphical rather than full coding. And then be able to, when a new headset comes out, just move your code uh, or use what you've learned and just keep doing it. So it really cannot be underpinned enough about how great uh, it is to be able to develop things in this space. So lately I've been getting into the Apple Vision Pro along with everybody else. And this device will include advanced sensors and cameras that can leverage um, and create detailed environments and maps, detect obstacles and recognize objects text, providing real-time assistance. So there's a huge potential with this device. Um, native Apple development is with Swift, uh, but now recently released is the Unity component. So I'm showing here the a Unity component that takes a very quick, very quickly, I was able to take just the Unity kind of 3D view of the virtual world and add a toggle button that when you click it, it adds the donut on top of it. So I'm working on moving this over to the Apple Vision Pro simulator, and it'll make it so when you put on the device, you'll be able to click a button and have my view of the world, the donut, the center vision, the dimming in the dots by sensing how much light's in the room or picking, you know, figuring out what the room situation's like and then adjusting. So. I really should be able to, you know, with the links, with the Apple Vision Pro, uh, with the visor, uh, continue to, you know, create something that people can experience what it's like to see it the way I see it, uh, but also create things that when people wear these devices, it brightens the scene and tells them what's in front of them and all the, all the benefits that we talked about. And here's another example of the Apple. So the, um, the other one was with Unity. This was one I created with Swift. So creating an application, running it in the Apple Vision Pro uh, simulator, and then uh, showing again, even when I wear, when I eventually get to wear the Apple Vision Pro, I'll eventually, you know, I still have the same issue of the donut. I'll feel like I'm seeing the whole vision that they're showing me, but I will uh, have the donut, and my and my best vision will be like moving my head around and taking that center vision and putting it on the things that um, that I want to see. Okay, 
All right, so, um, okay, so anyone that's involved with computer vision must know Carl Gutag. Uh, he was at um, AWE 2023. I got to see one of his presentations and talk to him, and he is just so knowledgeable about um, optics. And, you know, as we know, this is a super critical component of XR is the optics, the lenses, and everything that makes what we eventually need to uh, work correctly. He provides technology insights, hardware analysis, and uh, comparative technology reviews. His insights into technology like pancake optics help drive discussions to create more compact and comfortable wearable devices. There's some great videos online with him talking to all different experts. And, you know, he's, he's a realist that understands what our current technical state is and what we need to get to. And he works with companies to drive them forward so we can eventually get to that, you know, what's impossible today of full vision uh, in the screen. Eventually, we'll be able to get to that. You know, my take from him right now is that it's not possible to physically not possible to create the technology we need to have full human vision. Uh, my hope is in the future that uh, maybe driven by AI, we'll be able to overcome a lot of those uh, limitations. When I was a kid, they used to always tell us that um, we would never break the speed of sound. And uh, then the other thing they said, okay, even if we break the speed of sound, we'll never be able to regenerate nerve cells. You know, I would always ask, can I just get my eyes replaced with other eyes? And no, never, it'll never happen. We could never do it in a million years. And now I just read an article that they're actually uh, doing eye transplants and regenerating the optic nerve and expecting the person to regain sight, which blows my mind. I can't believe how much the world has changed. And I'm really excited about that. Um, Carl has a six part series on the Apple Vision Pro. It's worth going to his site just to read that, but there's so many great things there about computer vision, about the obstacles we have in front of us and you know how companies do those trade-offs, you know, where they either have to give up on resolution or give up on field of view or give up on something and what it's going to take to overcome that eventually. Uh, it's definitely one of the most comprehensive sites I've ever seen on computer vision. Okay, so, and then, so now, so the other one for web, uh, so this is just another example of looking at Carl's site with, uh, with a donut and having to move around a lot and scan a lot. Okay, so I'm going to go into some of the influencers that I, Wow, there's so many great people out there creating videos. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with all these folks. And there's so many of them. They're all awesome. I love all of them. I try to watch all the videos to learn the most about XR and the devices available. Um, but one of the people that seems to just have this incredible connection with the companies is Stanley Bradley. If a product is coming out and it's new and it's going to have certain capabilities, this is always where I seem to hear about it first. So you're probably all aware of it already, but I'm just putting out there, um, you know, all of you have more knowledge and more things about all of this XR, but um, I can't wait to hear you know, your ideas. But I'm just going to tell you what I what I've found and what's helped me in case it helps anybody else out there. Sally is Bradley uh, showcases content related to XR technologies, creates in depth reviews and analysis and product demos. There's a ton of channels talking about XR. But I find myself constantly coming back to this one uh, to get the latest information. You know, with a new pair of glasses that are coming out there, and have the resolution, brightness, everything I need. Another one is a Scared Ghost. And these, these guys were all at um, AWE and they go to CES and they're totally tied in, just a great way, along with all the other hundreds of people out there that are doing this uh, to learn about the information. Scared Ghost covers a wide range of topics in the realm of XR, updates and insights on the latest development in the XR industry, such as new product launches and industry trends. Just a very creative person and seems really tied into the XR industry and definitely a good place to check out. All right, so now shifting gears a little bit to AI. Um, I found this person, one little coder that I subscribe to their channel, so I get their announcements. And every time something new comes out in AI, he is on it within 15 minutes to two hours. He has a video out of how to use it, how to go into Google Collab, 
and within like, you know, 10 to 20 minutes, have something that's working with the latest technology uh, that he's stepped through step by step, telling you exactly how to do it. And so anything, you know, if there's something about X, uh, about AI that interests you, about uh, I see all kinds of translation things with audio. And for me, it's computer vision. There's so much out there and you can you can quickly, you know, whether even if you don't have a lot of coding experience, you can quickly with Google Collab, even as a designer, try and prototype things that will give you a great understanding of how your design is going to turn into the technology. Um, so really highly recommend it. The do-it-yourself coding tutorials are amazing resources. The content helps with simple step-by-step -step guides. It's a great way to stay on top of the latest industry news um, and just, just a great way to get started and move quickly. Okay, another one in Vellum uh, Tutorials, he uh, puts out videos about how to work with Unity. Um, over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of great YouTube folks that put out videos of how to do things. Um, you know, we're, we're all in this group with uh, X Reality Pro and working with professionals on, on projects and bringing in the people that are that are needed to have that special skills. You know, we used to do that all the time at work, that we were in a very obscure industry of real-time systems for SCADA systems and things like that. There's only, you know, one to 200 people in the world that have been working on these things. And we would always bring in experts that have the expertise in whatever it is you're trying to do. And that's what I find I can get um, from these folks. I can get kind of randomly whatever it is that's hot and that they're working on. But hooking up with groups you know, like X Reality Pro and bringing in experts is just another way of getting specific skill sets and learning specific things you know, on your own time. But uh, definitely for random learning about technology and being able to apply it, uh, these are some of my some of my favorites. So another is a uh, Dilmer. He's an XR programmer with expertise in Unity, C Sharp. Uh, he's been the main things that I've uh, worked with him on. Apple Vision Pro. He's now getting into that and uh, providing a lot of content there. He creates XR development content, including prototypes and videos. So it's these videos that kind of take it from scratch. Over the last ten years, I mean, I, I learned Unity by watching these videos. I've learned uh, Python with computer vision and then Google Collab and then now AI. And it's amazing to me how quickly you can get um, up to speed and try these things. And then kind of now my plan is to kind of settle in with some of the devices that actually work for me, like the links, and start building applications to bring these capabilities to bear, either show people how I see or help my vision or help other people with similar uh, vision. Okay, so wrap up. Four minutes. All right. So this is the crux of what I'm saying. There's been a lot of progress in the last 10 years. Much more progress is needed. Uh, once we have the tech to enhance vision um, or provide alternate capabilities for similar functionality, so whether we have tech that improves visuals or whether we have other tech like spatial audio and everything that delivers the information in a different way, you know, as that tech becomes um, ubiquitous, you know, I I feel like I would wear anything. I'd wear a contraption on my head with cameras all over it and the wires hanging off of me. And I'd go out in public, no problem, if I could see and operate, you know, in the world, function in the world. Um, but most of the people I know that are in the blind low vision community feel the totally opposite. They they'd rather have no help if they could just sit with our friends and hang out and not stand out and not be noticed. So, so we really need to get all this technology that's moving in a great direction, get it minimized, miniaturized, and get it so it's uh, ubiquitous, so everyone has it, and it's um, something that uh, doesn't stand out in the crowd. And you know, everyone's wearing it, whatever it is. If it's the Apple Vision Pro and everybody has it on those in their face, great. But if it turns into just a pair of glasses that looks just like a regular pair of glasses and gives all these capabilities and spatial audio and uh, haptics and everything, uh, that's that's really what we need. But getting all that technology is one thing. The other thing we need is all the rest of all you folks in XR that are the designers and the planners and the 
um, UX, you know, all of that work to make it make sense. You know, it's fe feasibly possible someday, it's gonna be technically possible to have everything we wanted, but the people that put it together and make it easy to use and helpful, uh, that's just such a big part of it. And um, look forward to work working with uh, both sides, the technical coders and the folks that are just making so this crazy technology just helps people and uh, everybody can do that easily. So thank you for joining today. I really appreciate your time and I look forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I learned a lot from you because I think this is very important. And uh, yeah, you mentioned that you like to work uh, uh, for kind of like a more like a discussion and uh, work with more professionals diving. And we do for x Pro, we do have uh, workshops Hacker and workshops uh, pair up with Hackersall. Right now, we are in the process of partnering with other um, Hackersall group, and hopefully there might be something coming up. And uh, I, I saw you have a great knowledge of all those like uh, understanding of accessibilities. And uh, besides you, you yourself is also uh, a person who understand the, the, the group really well. So I think I, I uh, maybe after the uh, talk, I will follow up and see um, if there's any way that we can kind of like uh, um, create uh, either workshop or Hackersall, just targeting uh, accessibilities. And also I'm uh, writing a book uh, which is related to UX design. And I have a section, uh, 10 UX principles um, for XR. And one of the section is accessibility. So mm -hmm. uh, I would like to kind of like a see if you are available. I would love to kind of arrange like a, an interview and ask you for your opinion and all your um, kind of respond or answer will be uh, fully cited, credited uh, in the book. Also kind of help people to understand uh, how we can do better for the group people that needs um, a lot of like accessibility settings for, for the XR experience. So yeah. yeah that, that sounds really great. I mean, I really enjoyed working with MIT Reality Hack and it's amazing how you bring these groups of people together like you're describing for hackathons and workshops and they come in and there's part of them that just wants the technology but there's part that really wants to make the world a better place. And so at MIT Reality Hack, two of the projects that are winning top prizes were actually the two that I mentioned. So it's incredible. People want to help and they want to do the technology and it all it does pay off in the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I saw Jim and uh, Homa. Yeah. Um, uh, this is just a fantastic presentation. I think one of the best presentations we've ever had here at X Reality. And it's so comprehensive and so insightful. Um, I've done a lot of work in computer vision and what I often do is I try to put myself uh, sort of in the shoes of the computer and imagine what the computer is seeing given the algorithms that I'm using. And so that helps me to improve those algorithms so that it can see better. And you've done us done a great job of showing us exactly what you see. So I have a few questions about that. Um, it sounds like what's happening with the black part of the donut with your visual system is that your visual system is using visual saccades to um, fill in the black part. Uh, is that your understanding of what's happening? Yeah, I mean, that's the best description I've, I've ever heard of it. Um, you know, I think about it a lot because, you know, I, I, you know, I meant to get into a little bit of foveated uh, rendering. Like, I'm not sure if everyone's, come, I'm, I'm sure you know it 100%, but the, the concept that when you're, when you're staring at the donut, you're having the highest resolution in the circle of donut and a little bigger for regular vision. And then it's going, your vision actually deteriorates going out from there, but you don't even notice it because you, and foveated rendering does the same thing. It like highlights where you're looking right. with high resolution. Um, so already that area of the donut is mostly lower resolution. And yeah. I do feel like, like you say, that it is just somehow it's filling in information from memories of what it saw 
that stitches together to be something that does hold it holds water. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm seeing like a bizarre alternate reality. Like I think I'm seeing the kitchen. Yeah. Just, I could walk ahead and just trip over the trash barrels right in the middle of the floor. And even I'm seeing a kitchen with no trash barrels. So but that was a good description of, you know, it does seem to be taking those components and filling them in in a way that stitches so that it's imperceivable for me that I'm not seeing the kitchen, even though I'm 100% not seeing it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I have this, I, I've never talked about this really in public, but I have this unusual visual uh, sort of capacity. And what it is, is that I can see my visual saccades. Most people cannot see them, but I see them. And you could, you know, consider that to be an asset or um, uh, you know, a curse. I, I don't know how, how you might look at it, but I can tell when they're happening. I can see exactly what's going on. And so um, I have a real sense for these visual saccades. And it's interesting to think of how they're filling things in, filling in the details. Um, some, some people say they can see the donut. Like, like one thing is if you if you stare at a bright light, like anyone, if you're out in the sun and you come into like a bank lobby or whatever, or a hotel lobby and it's dimly lit, or if you stare at a light on your wall, if you stare at a light that's near your white wall, and then yeah. you move your head and you stare at the wall, you should see dots. And when I do that, I can actually see the donut. Like I can see the whole donut kind of forms in that. Um, but some people say they can actually see the donut. And I, I can't decide what I like better, kind of like you're saying about your situation. That I'm kind of glad I can't see it because if it was constantly there, my brain would constantly be thinking about it. So I have to be really careful because I think I can see and I can't. I know. Um, I think that's, that's better than seeing a big donut hanging out in front of my face. Yeah. Um, I, well, you talked about upcoming technologies, which I thought was very interesting, uh, very insightful. I can think of some caveats uh, that we'll probably run into when trying to apply those technologies to this application. Uh, however, I have to preface this by saying that I'm an engineer and I view problems as solutions that are just waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the caveats is that with the Vision Pro, you have this cable that attaches to its battery. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if somehow the cable becomes dislodged or the battery dies, um, the Vision Pro will go black. Mm -hmm. and, uh, because a lot of people see the pictures of the Vision Pro with someone's eyes in the front of it, and they mm -hmm. think that it's transparent, but it's not transparent. Uh, there's a lot of circuit boards and processors and so forth between your eyes and the front of that unit. And uh, so uh, unlike something like a HoloLens, which becomes clear when it loses power, when the Vision Pro loses power, it goes black. So that's a caveat. Uh, you might consider it a problem, but I think it's just a solution that's waiting to happen. And so um, that's one of them. Uh, the other interesting thing about the Vision Pro is it has a fairly bright display. Now it's using a, a 4K per eye OLED display and OLEDs typically aren't that bright, but the reason why they're not that bright, part of the reason is that they have a very wide uh, field of view, a, a very wide angle in which they're dispersing light. And whenever you have that situation, the intensity of the light falls off as according to what's called the inverse square law. So um, the light falls off as one over the distance squared to the display. But the interesting thing with Vision Pro is that those OLED displays are right next to your eyeball. Mm -hmm. So there's not much distance between your eyeball and those displays. So it hasn't had a chance for the light to fall off very much mm -hmm. uh, yet. So that's, uh, that's an interesting way to sort of look at those displays in the Vision Pro. Now, one of the capabilities that the Vision Pro has is this foveated rendering that you referred to. Now, the question I have for you, I don't know if you, like uh, with the, um, with Meta's uh, Quest Pro, that has foveated re rendering as well. And I don't know if, I know that's not bright enough for you, but I don't know whether you've tried it 
with the foveated rendering on versus off. Have you tried that? I have. It's it's not bright enough to give me all the benefits on the links, but I can I can see like a hazy image. Yeah. And I have tried the foveated rendering and it seemed to work fine. I mean, the way everyone describes it is if you turn it on and you look at it and you can't tell the difference, then it's it's working. Well <laughs> so in that case it worked. It would be very interesting to have you try the Vision Pro with the foveated rendering turned on and with it turned off. Now the foveated rendering will improve the uh, performance of the Vision Pro in terms of its ability to render a lot of stuff quickly. But in your case, you're not seeing a whole lot of stuff. That's so right, yeah. I, I don't know if that's gonna help. Now, the interesting thing though, is when the foveated rendering turned on, you're going to lose whatever peripheral vision you have. Uh, because it's not going to be displaying that area with the foveated rendering turned off. So it'd be fascinating to see what mm -hmm. your perception is with the Vision Pro on with foveated rendering turned off versus turned on. It may be that you will see more with it turned off. So that's just something that fascinates me. And it'd be very interesting to, to hear the results of that experiment. Um, you know, it, it makes me think of a couple things that, um, you know, the field of view with these glasses, um, like the, the early glasses I worked on with maybe 50. Yes. The, the newer glasses are maybe, you know, 90 to 110. It's kind of the current range. All of those fall into the donut. So I, I've only, out at uh, AWE, there were some amazing sessions. I walked up to some booths that it was just optics, like, hanging out in space they just had it like they had all these tables but they just had the optics just like hanging in space and you'd walk up to them and just put your face up to them there was no like yeah. headset or anything and on those i got to see ones that had uh 190 210 um field of view and it was amazing how i could see with that i believe you could that rendering too but i could see meaning meaning I could see most that the motion was happening as peripheral vision. I couldn't read a sign or anything, but I could see there was something going on. No. But the interesting thing is all the headsets I've worked with up to now, including the links, all the field of view ends before the donut ends. So now that, I that is rendering. I mean, I only have that little circle. Everything that is a fascinating is. observation. And um, so if you have uh, a display that doesn't go beyond your black donut, mm -hmm. then you are not gonna notice any difference between foveated rendering on or off. Now with the vision- the only Pro, it could have for me is just if it helps the device speed up to get better yes, information. Yes, yeah. yes. But you're right, visually no benefit. Yeah. Yes, uh, now with the Vision Pro, it has a field of view that's 120 degrees. So yeah, it's unusually wide. And um, so, uh, you may be able to have that peripheral vision within the Vision Pro. Now you're gonna, you're obviously gonna need corrective lenses for the Vision Pro, and yeah. and so they have those magnetic corrective lenses that you can get. Um, and I think with the developers kit for those of us rare people who are able to get their hands on the developers kit, um, I think they automatically pay for one set of uh, corrective lenses for that. I think they come from Bausch and Loam or something. I'd have Excellent. to, I'd have to review the details. Uh, but anyways, um, so yeah, one of the challenges is I think my donut goes up to 134 degrees. Oh, 134 so degrees. Yeah, okay. so unfortunately, until they get to where they're like, you know, 170, 190, I'm not really going to get a lot of benefits. You know, okay. even that, you know, they say they say for everyone that peripheral, our peripheral vision. Is really just so you see if a lion's going to jump at you out in the bushes, but but it is it is nice when I saw that two ten uh, field of view, it was remarkably better. The experience was better, more comfortable. You know, having nothing, yeah, feels, having anything, even just colors moving, you know, does give a better sense of seeing than um, you know than nothing. Yeah. yeah, in the real world, your peripheral version vision is probably of limited use because of the brightness issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. But if you could get that wide of a field of view with a computer display that's bright enough, then all of a sudden maybe that peripheral vision would become more useful to you. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, another caveat, um, although 
like I said, these are just uh, solutions waiting to happen. Um, is that in terms of large language models, at least now with the current technology, they typically take a large amount of memory. And um, that's what you're not going to have in something like the Vision Pro. And uh, also, you, you could say, well, let's offload it to the cloud and the processing and the memory and so forth to the cloud. But um, then you run into another issue, and that is lag. And so in your application, you're not going to want lag. So you're mm -hmm. going to want to run whatever you're running on the headset itself. Now, I know that uh, for the Quest series of headsets, uh, Meta provides the option of running a cable between the headset and the uh, and a computer that has a high-speed graphics processor in it. And... Um, and who knows, gobs of memory, you know, 128 gigabytes of memory you could have. And <clears throat> so that might be useful. Um, it might introduce some lag. I don't know if Apple is going to provide that type of capability or not. I haven't heard anything about that. Uh, so that might be a potential, you know, solution waiting to happen. If you could do that, if you could ha perhaps have something with you, maybe a MacBook Air in a backpack mm -hmm. that's got some extra processing power for you. I, I don't know. It's just... Uh, I, I love that idea. One thing I was thinking, because real-time systems, uh, we used to always kid about putting them in the cloud because of that latency issue. With real-time yeah. systems, you know, you need really fast processing and really local capabilities. And every time people would be like, oh, let's put it in the cloud. I was like, I no, you're not getting it, but it's really important. You can't put it in the cloud. You can't have, you know, 90 seconds of, uh, 90 milliseconds of latency when right, you need. Right, right. It's just no good. It's no uh, good. So one thing I was thinking is running it, uh, running the large language models and the AIs, uh, like just at nano edge devices, things like that might give away to, with a lot of GPUs and a lot of memory and give away to uh, run the model very quickly. Because I would need it to, if I'm walking along, I would need it to, detect the objects and let me know pretty quickly, you know? Well, here's here's one way to partic to possibly partition up the problem. And that is um, take some heavy duty calculations like with a large language model and put some of that in the cloud so mm -hmm. that it's looking ahead and detecting objects a little bit further away from you and recognizing those objects. And then take the stuff that requires absolutely low latency and partitioning that into the headset itself. Uh, and then maybe there's sort of a, a way that you can uh, uh, you know, hand off parts of that problem to the cloud where the power is, and but while keeping still some of the low latency stuff right in the headset itself. So that you know, you're me think of self-driving cars when you say that, because I keep reading how they're doing the same thing. You know, they have this super fast, don't crash any crash into anything. And then they have the, you know, what's my whole map? You know, maybe that's local, but moves to the side on other processors. What's my what's my navigation? You know, what's my next turn in five minutes? And then they tie to the cloud for a lot of other things. So they do yeah. that tier approach that you're talking about. I, I think that's a great idea. In fact, um, I've worked... Uh, on self-driving car software. And um, one of the major auto manufacturers, I helped them implement my graduate research in uh, computer vision on, on their car, on their self-driving car. Uh, wow. That was an obstacle avoidance type of uh, uh, application. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. You think self-driving -car, self cars, robots, and then everything that I said, you put that all together and you end up with a similar solution it's just instead of driving a car, you're driving a person, but it should be just as seamless. You can't, if you didn't know a Tesla was a Tesla, you wouldn't know that it was driving itself. It's making all the same things you'd see. People with low vision and blindness in many ways just want to be able to walk into a restaurant, you know, go up to the hostess, walk to the table, find the, find the bathroom, you know, all these things, just normal things, which when you think of it as a self-driving car, it's very similar concepts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um... I'm going to let other people get in and ask their questions because I've taken up enough time. But I just wanted to mention uh, in passing that um, I may I may contact you. Uh, yeah, please, please. I 
computer vision is the cornerstone of everything I do, Jim. And I really appreciate your time and your questions. That'd be great. Okay, thanks. Uh, go ahead. If someone else, I see Valerie here. Hi, Valerie. Valerie and I know each other for we've known each other for some time. Uh, hey, if anyone hi. else has any hi, questions, Valerie. hi. I do have a question, mm -hmm. if I may. Go just, ahead. Um, yes. Okay, I wrote it down just because it kind of a few parts. Um, so over last summer, I was diagnosed with a floater in one of my eyes, um, uh, a large black one. Apparently, it looks like a little half of a fly stuck in my eye. And um, they said the uh, retina is intact, um, so I could just, but there's really no treatment for it. Um, if they risk doing a treatment, it could splurt it into many floaters. So I'm just going to live with what I have. Um, and the doctor recommended um, for me um, no skydiving or bungee jumping because of the sudden jolt mm -hmm. and also roller coasters that might have that um, in the experience. Um, but I didn't find that out until after my meeting was over. And I just happened to ask, well, so is there anything you recommend? And then she said, yeah, those three things. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, if I had not asked, I wouldn't have known that. Um, Cause I'm not a bungee jumper or a skydiver, um, but I certainly like roller coasters. So that will be curtailed. But my question is um, for your solution with the increased light that you have, is there any um, uh, long-term uh, negative effects for that, or do you have to uh, curtail it to a certain amount of time, or is there no problem? It's a great question, and I think as displays, you know, at 100 nits of display is never going to hurt anybody, but now at a 1,000 nits, as Jim said, close to the eye, I definitely think that's going to start coming into play, and, and I'm glad a lot of the people I know are, are doctors and scientists that are in this discussion, too, that are you know, I think that is going to become an important factor because, like I say, when, when people, like, everyone can see, the dots everyone sees, as I understand it, are floaters. It's just that their normal vision, their full vision comes over and, and overwhelms it. But if they stare at a light for 30 seconds and then look at a white wall, they'll see. And I recommend you try this, too, because you should see your main floater with other floaters around it, and the other ones will all clear which is what you want. Uh, for me, I have millions of floaters. And when I look at a bright light, I go outside. It, um, they stay for like a half an hour. So most people come in and your eyes take a few seconds to adjust. That same, you know, almost everything's gone. Happens to me even in a brightly lit area, you know, inside area, it will go. So the floaters things is very interesting. Um, it's great that you have just the one floater rather than the donut. The donut is when they all get together and you end up with a big area of it. So I love roller coasters, but I also do not go on them anymore. So I, I share your pain there. Um, but yep, I would, uh, yeah, I would say that that is going to become important. The human eye can see 20,000 nits. And I guess Meta is working on some standalone displays like mounted to a wall at this point that can go to like 20 and 40,000. So I think once it starts getting to where it's more light than you're getting just looking out on a sunny day and everything, or because it's so close and shining right in your eyes, I think it will be important to make sure that um, it doesn't further degrade the retina. So I definitely. I, I think though that Valerie is bringing up an additional point that's uh, very important in all of this. And that is, um, what I've read before is that for certain types of visual impairments, if you just increase the brightness, what happens is the eye habituates to that. And so in, in essence, it the eye sort of develops sort of an immunity to the brightness and so that it has less effectiveness uh, hmm. as time goes on. And so um, I don't know, have you noticed that with your brightest uh, headset? I have not noticed that. Okay, well, that's good. Uh, that's good. Interesting. I mean, both of your questions are great and make me think, what's the threshold? You know, what is that threshold? And yes. how do we test to it without hurting ourselves? Because, um, I mean, I, they, the doctors have always given me dark sunglasses to wear outside. Because yeah. when you have a degenerative retinal disease, that bright light can have a negative effect on it. Um, so, but it makes me think, now that we're putting something right next to our faces, and it's going to be bright, you know, 
direct that close thousandness. You know, the, no one brings the sunlight, you know, right next to, they don't shine it right in your eyes. So, so it's probably less than 20,000, you know, nits. And what is that threshold? I, um, it'd be interesting. There's another very interesting aspect of this. And that is uh, for both of you, for Valerie and, and Chris, the, um, the existence of the floaters. Here's a very interesting thing about the floaters. Um, it's very similar uh, to when you have like a, a digital camera and you've got dust on the image sensor. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have that scenario and you have the lens on the camera wide open, the aperture wide open, you don't see the dust in the pictures. Uh, and the reason why is because when the lens is wide open like that, when the aperture is wide open, you have a very broad cone of light that focuses down onto the image sensor. And so what it does is it blurs out that dust that's on the image sensor. But when you're in very bright conditions, the, the lens has to close down to compensate for all that extra light. And mm -hmm. when it does, you suddenly have a much narrower cone of light impinging upon the image sensor. It's more like a, a, a pencil uh, of light. And so um, what it does is it tends to highlight the dust on the image sensor in more detail. So what you might experience is when you're looking at a bright, in fact, Valerie, you might, you might have noticed this before. When you're looking at a computer screen that's like bright white, you may see your floaters very clearly because it's causing the the iris of your eye to close close and form a much narrower pencil of light going to the retina and so those floaters which are sort of sitting in front of the 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 retina they're shown in much more detail you might have noticed that yeah, yeah, I noticed it when I look up in the sky. And that's yes. when I was fascinated one time when I looked up and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can see it like right there. And yes. then if I turn look this way, it follows and it goes that way. Mm -hmm. and then like the doctor said, my brain will adjust and I'll ignore it. And that does happen a lot of the time. I, I see I'm aware of it, um, you know, every hour, but yes. it just I just accept it and I go on. Yeah. yeah, in fact, photographers use exactly that test when they're looking for dust on their image sensor, they will take their camera and point it at the sky. And that causes the aperture to narrow down on the lens and it highlights all the dust on the image sensor, just like you're seeing the floaters highlighted. So, uh, Yeah, so if I may ask one other question along that. So I want to pick out a headset. Um, I'm very interested to create content for virtual worlds and augmented reality. I've, I've done two hackathons um, a while back, one in Unity and one in Unreal. Had a great time with that. And so I want to jump back in. Um, and so I'm trying to pick out my headset from that. And you mentioned a new one. Um, I began with an L. I forget the, uh, um, it had a short name. Um, yeah, the visor. I think it was the visor, maybe. Uh, or the one that was I, also on the visor. It was a, the other one. Links. Um, links. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Uh, so the links. The links is um, coming. Uh, the links is out and working through their their uh, original people that uh, funded the company and getting those out. They're they're doing shipments into next year. There's some great videos out there from Stan LaRoque at Links. If you check out the videos. He goes through, he shows all the capabilities of the device, and he talks about the shipping and everything. Um, so the Lynx is out, and I think right now I have an, another one ordered that I think I'm going to get like at the end of the first quarter, he was saying. So um, so if you put in an order now, hopefully you'd have it by the, the end of the first quarter or whatever. But there's yeah. there French-based companies that are shipping from France and everything. I didn't. Um, yeah. Uh, it, does yours have a depth sensor in it? Because the quick look I did, it didn't look like it had a depth sensor in it. So it doesn't have a depth sensor. A lot of companies are moving away from depth sensors, although I believe the Apple may be putting it in. But a lot of companies have moved away from it. They use the two cameras for stereo, and they get the depth from that. Oh, I see. And, and it's funny. I think I just I think I heard that um, Tesla and everything they used to have sensors. Everyone had sensors all over the place. I think they reduced it all down to just cameras, as I understand that all different kinds of cameras. But they're not using depth sensors either. I don't think and like lidar and everything. I think people are finding that it gets thrown off by sunlight and it gets has all these issues. So I think they're everyone's kind of moving down to cameras. 
Um, so if something has a depth sensor, it's nice. But for me, the stereo vision is the most important thing. Um, but then again, you look at Midas and AI, and it figures it out without stereo vision. I can figure out depth. So I mean, it's amazing to me how we're getting depth, uh, which is so I'm sure you're thinking the same thing. Without depth, it's impossible for anyone to help because you need to know how far away something is, you know, if you're going to trip over it or whatever. So, yeah. Well, I think an interesting aspect of that is that if you're going to use stereo to compute a depth map, uh, and often those depth maps aren't necessarily the best, but mm -hmm. if you're going to use stereo to compute a depth map, that takes computation, significant computation. And so um, you may find that if you have a LIDAR sensor available, it is a much lower cost uh, route to getting depth information than... Um, than depth from stereo if you know it's a it's a good thing to try out to test and as a comparison uh from a yeah. standpoint so valerie back to your question i just want to say that um you know right now if i could see like regular relatively full vision i think the thing i would buy right now if i was going to buy something that i wanted in my hands is the quest three um and you could look at Dilmar's site. Uh, I think a couple of the people that I mentioned, if you go to their sites, I think they all have Quest 3 Unity development. And it really, I mean, for me, it has 100 nits, so it doesn't work for me. But um, I believe it has a depth sensor. It has the, the stereo cameras. It has basically as a development platform to fool around with. It, that's what I would buy if it had if it had four to 500 nits. And it's only like $500, I think. Um, you know, that brings up an excellent point. Uh, one of the as one of the characteristics of the Quest Pro, or I mean, of the of the Quest Three, is that unlike the Quest Pro, it does not have eye tracking. Uh, do you, right. in your research, have you found any pros or cons to having eye tracking to to help with your your work? I haven't. I mean, the only thing I see eye tracking valuable for at this point would be foveated rendering, and that would be a cut the processing of the device, like we talked about earlier. Yeah. But yeah. Um, so, so I, you know, I see brightness and contrast as my number one, and then stereo vision aligned with reality is number two. Like those give the most benefit to me, and the Quest Three has both of those. Um, and and the one thing that you know, if you could get a Lynx in your hands tomorrow, I would recommend the Lynx because it's a completely open development environment. It's a hundred percent rooted. You can do whatever you want with it. Every time you do meta development, it is like a sea of, you know, challenges of things restricted and you can't do that. I think the Apple might be similar uh, as I get into the Apple development, but they really restrict it for, I don't know, privacy and all these things that I think you could find solutions around. They just make it so you, like there was supposed to be a depth sensor in the uh, MetaQuest Pro. And like two months before it came out, they pulled it because they were having issues uh, with what it was seeing, and they thought it could cause issues. So instead of disabling it and turning it on later, they pulled it physically out of the device. Um, mm -hmm. Like that's the backwards of what I need. I need uh, more stuff going in. Uh, like you said, Jim, I I would love depth sensors. They're just not consistently put in, so I'm avoiding them because I don't usually have access to them. I uh, where, yeah. One thing I'm going to throw in here. I think uh, Valerie may be too modest to say this, but. Um, Valerie is a member of the LA 3D Club, uh, and and so we we know each other from that. And as I recall, Valerie has taught classes in in 3D movie making at UCLA. Am I correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, Very I, impressive. That's awesome. Just for uh, for 25 years. <laughs> wow, that's really really great. Wow. So I didn't want things to pass without throwing that. Oh, in. That's Hey, Valerie, Val Valerie, is there possible that we invite you to be one of the speaker? Because I think a 3D uh, kind of like a uh, uh, cinema is very interesting. And um, next year, we will have another uh, theater design. His name is Ari. He has mm -hmm. been doing like uh, acting and also mocap and virtual production. He will be speaking as well. So I think your topic might be like a very relate to to that and also we were thinking about partner um with mozilla hub but it's still in the progress 
and mm -hmm. doing maybe a hackathon for virtual production next year. Mm -hmm. So there oh. might be some interesting um like uh, uh things happening and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's yes. what we do because I think that there are a lot of interesting aspects and the partner with or sponsored mm -hmm. by some uh companies and we do some interesting uh deep dive in into those topics and brainstorming just like uh chris mentioned that uh mit reality uh, kind of hackers also yeah this is just my thought yeah. i would love to see that presentation uh valerie if you wanted to speak i would love to hear all about it it sounds fascinating oh, yeah. thank you jim for that that um initiation <laughs> <laughs> um yes i'm happy to do that and um that i i was an adjunct instructor so i just taught there um one night a week for those for that time and my my day job was at dreamworks feature animation making computer animated films um so with a bit of a heads up i can contact them to see if i could show some extra content um and so uh because i did do presentations for them in the past um i would sometimes fill in so yeah we can chat about that and i could fold the two together and valerie is a great speaker i've been to her talks before and she's fabulous wonderful <laughs> Oh, yeah. so one of the things I'm doing, Valerie, is uh, I want to, once I get my eyes uh, documented with Python and how to make it so how I see, I'm going to work with some of my friends that have the reverse. They can't see in the middle circle and see relatively normally around it. Uh, but, you know, I, I'd love to have something that eventually, because when, when we tell the family what it is you're seeing, it's sometimes it can be so hard for them to understand. And if there was a way for you to show it, I think, you know, when I show my family how I see, most people just start crying uh, because then they had no idea. They're like, oh, my gosh, I had no idea that's how you see. Um, you, know so it's, what would be, be, you know what would be fascinating? You, you remember the movie Memento? Oh, yeah. yeah. Love that movie. Where the guy didn't, didn't have any memory. And so he would write things like on his arm and stuff to remind himself. Right. Maybe it would be fascinating to have a sort of a small feature film or whatever that uh, spent a day with you going about your day, seeing the world the way that you see the world and yeah, I mean, to adapt yeah. the way that you adapt. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be surprising to people, um, even even when you show how I see, it's hard for them to imagine it in their own vision. Like the idea, like you pretty much would have to close your eyes. I mean, I don't recommend anyone doing this, but you pretty much would have to close your eyes and walk around to get a feel for it. I always say to people, when you're staying at a hotel room in the middle of the night and you're with other people and you don't want to turn on the lights and you have to go to the bathroom and you're on the far side of the room and you're working your way over to the bathroom, you're feeling yourself, you know, you're knocking in your knees, you're, you're tripping, you're stubbing your toe. Like that's the closest I can imagine other people get to experiencing uh, what it's like. Um, but I, but I love that. I think, I think if you took it and expanded it out to an entire view of like going to the restaurant, it would be shocking for people what it's like, you know, to have to live in that environment and operate in that environment with no tools to make it better. What, what do you think about that, Valerie? Would that be a good pitch? I have, yes, but I, um, I think that's very interesting. I mean, there's a couple ways you can do it. You could have, you know, like an app on your phone. So while the person sees real life, they take that up and they see your simulated view and there's that. But I was thinking about what if you fold in some of the benefits of the new technology that are being done for the visually impaired. I was so fascinated about the sound that you were talking about as you walk mm -hmm. through a park and you hear the sound of so on. So what if we were to take your experience of how you see the world, but somehow relate it to others, but uh, it's going to be strange when I say this because it's not thought out, but I'm going to say it anyway, but related in a positive way, the way the sound enhancements have enhanced, let's say, the walking through the park. So maybe when they bring up their phone and they see what your vision is, that's the only way they can see those enhancements, you know, mm -hmm. of the sound. Um, and then maybe... Uh, interactively, there can be other things that you would see in the darkened environment that you wouldn't see any other way, like extra things you can click on and you can maybe get more information and see um, eye candy of, of what's happening in the dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it's it's not your, it's, it's a different idea, but it's mm -hmm. also taking people with um, uh, uh, 
vision and hair impairment to um, make it, this is their life, this is what they're living, but they're, you know, how can their life be beautiful as well? Yeah, I really appreciate what you're saying. And it, it just kind of further points to me that one of the things I love about our reality hack and all the people I've met is that a large percentage of the people there, like 20%, were professional storytellers that I had I'd never even heard of that title before. And it was amazing how the projects were a thousand times better with their kind of creative thinking. So hearing you talking about it, it's like you take, to me, something very clinical and functional and it's not being able to see whatever. And then you talk to somebody like yourself that makes it very creative of how it could be to express it to other people. It just takes a group of people to come up with ideas like that. It's just, uh, you know, I love that. I love the idea of, you know, brainstorming on that kind of a concept and, and coming up with something that would uh, further show people uh, what it's like. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, any other questions, Homer? Um, um, yes, I had some <clears throat> questions that were kind of answered with Jim's line of questioning. Um, when I first saw the rendering of the black donut and um, it's a static image. So to me, the first thing I thought of, well, could you miniaturize the rest of the environment to fit inside the center that you could see? But then I think that would throw off your entire um sort of reality and one-to-one and -one mapping with your actual environment. And then I had to look up what Jim was saying with the with the saccade. So I guess your your eye is kind of moving around and sort of scanning the environment to sort of in memory piece together a, a mental map of everything. So I think that that actually helped me a lot. So in your next iteration of these presentations, if you had like a video kind of thing that showed mm -hmm. sort of the, the dancing I, or maybe just a, yeah, a short segment of that, that sort of piece together that for me. Um, I love, I love your thinking on that because, uh, I have, I've started to take my Python program and start uh, processing video. So you basically have the donut view, but it's a video of things like shifting across. And I agree with you. I love that idea. And it, it, I think there's something there, but it might be like situational. It might be when you're not moving, like not for, for navigation, you probably need the normal view aligned with the reality I'm finding or interacting with objects or something. But there's something about having that circle that's valuable and putting enough resolution in there to put more information in there. I totally agree with you. You know, could you take the whole scene and squish it into that space under such high resolution that it would give me more like, uh, the concept of what I'm looking at, you know, the context of everything that's there. I wouldn't use it to pick up things or navigate, but I, I do think there's something in that thinking that you're saying. I, I think that's part of the solution. Yeah, it's almost like what? looking at, at uh, something under a microscope or maybe the opposite mm -hmm. where you're not blowing it up, but you're shrinking it down so I can see it. And maybe it's a different experience than navigating your world, but you could like maybe get a, a summary, right? You're clicking on something and shrink it down. And then suddenly you, you've you eaten something from Alice in Wonderland and you, you see it, you know, in, an ex, in a reverse uh, view or something. But one of the reasons I think that's going to work is because people have the opposite vision from me that can't see in the circle, but see pretty well and everything else, the donut and all other areas. The solution for them is the, is the zoom. So to me, it seems like reverse zooming should yeah. be a solution because oh. when they zoom, if they're dri if you're driving on the highway and there's a car in front of you and that circle is covering the entire car, if you zoom the image, now the circle is just covering the license plate and you can see the car. So, so zooming is a huge part of the solution overall for people that have that type of vision and that kind of need. But it does make me think there's once high resolution comes and high brightness, I think there will be something with doing reverse zooming uh, for me. It's right. a great idea, Helen. Right. Is your donut fuzzy or is it sharply delimited? So this goes back to the fact that I don't see it. You know? Oh, yeah, yeah. That makes it even worse because I don't know what part of my vision I'm actually seeing and what part I'm not. So right, I'm really right. careful. I will just I will just walk down the street and walk right into a telephone call. You yeah. know, or I'll walk right into a cabinet door that's open. And I have no idea, like I, I can't stare at a scene and have the door come and go. You know what I mean? It's not that, it's, uh, it's weird. My brain is doing weird things. Everything, the donut and maybe outside the donut, you know, it's, 
it's unusable. Really, it's only that center circle. It's the only thing I can trust. Everything else is a, is a risk until something can, you know, like that haptic feedback of feeling. It's like Iron Man. You, know, you can put your hands up and you can feel that there's nothing in front of you. And to me, that is just blows my mind because I'm getting data that I never had before. So my other question was, you mentioned several headsets that you were trying. And my first thought about that was, um, was there a particular application or like a custom application that you were trying on each of the headsets in order to like, like I, I imagine you're using the headset to try to experience the world around you. Um, maybe with, you mentioned having extra brightness on there. But um, was it like in pass through mode that you're trying to see this, or were you just seeing that you're you're just trying various applications on the headset and just experience what their field of view was like and how your your donut was manifesting inside inside those headsets? Well, that's a great question. the The first headsets I was using were like Jim was saying, augmented reality, where you're looking through them; they have a clear screen. And it's kind of painting things in a square in front of you. So for those, I thought I was going to um, for those. I thought I was going to put a, like a TV screen out in front of me that would, ha would take in the image from the camera, brighten it with OpenCV, extra contrast, maybe highlight the edges and what a really cool thing that um, OpenCV can do, and then just display that in front of me. And now I have almost like a I think it was like a Terminator view and in the corner, you know, it could have a view that's better than my view and you wouldn't use it for navigation, but you could tell what um, things are looking, looking like. You have like a heads up display is what I thought I was going to be doing. And then I had all the problems with the light coming in and things like that. Um, that, that didn't really work. So then I moved to mixed reality, like you're saying, and that's where things really started to work for me because I could control the entire scene. And, and once I saw a mixed reality that was aligned with um, the real world and I had functional vision as if, you know, literally I'm standing in the kitchen, I want to reach up and pick something up. I can't see that it's there. I put on the links, I reach out, I pick it up. I mean, it's complete change. And so now I've changed my thinking from it has a display with a better view to, um, to having, you know, I, I mean, I want it all now. Now I can see I can have it all. So I want it all. These new headsets, I want I want a full field of view with bright and contrast for whatever I can see. And then I want other ways that it makes me realize things that I'm not seeing. I mean, now, back then I was thinking very small. Now it's like I'm probably way over my skis. You know, I really want it all. So when you, when you describe mixed reality, does that mean that it's kind of like pass through? It's bringing... Yeah. Yeah, cameras and you're just seeing everything at basically one-to-one -one ratio yeah and that's what the lynx has and um the meta quest pro and the quest 3 you know and the new apple device all have um all have that information but originally um, you were, yeah. originally you're saying you're you're going to make a a custom app that you're going to bump the brightness up with computer vision, then then pipe it in as like a 2D, um, I guess, yeah. TV screen, yeah. augmented reality style. And with the mixed reality, are you still able to hack into that um, pipeline, that pass-through pipeline, and uh -huh. really bump, the, bump the brightness up? Oh, great, great question. I've had this discussion with the Lynx guys a lot. So when you're doing real-time video, of cameras that you're displaying in real time and you're creating that immersive view that's aligned with reality. You just feel like you're seeing, you don't even realize you're looking at a computer, taking the picture and it's taking the computer stuff and mixing it together and you just feel like you're seeing. Um, as soon as you go to jump into that pipeline, it really uh, slows down the real time effect of it. So when I first got, when I first was playing around with these uh, mixed reality devices, the passer devices, I was trying to jump into the stream and everything, and I, I, the latency was just going too high. I didn't have real time anymore. But what I realized was with um, Unity is that, so with Unity, with OpenCV, with depth, I can now, in real time, take the image from the stream, detect what's there, put 
unity objects, so 3D virtual objects out in this mixed reality world, totally integrated, that are at the right place. You know, the microwave has a little thing in it that says microwave, the refrigerator, everything's marked. And I've learned about the things that are in the environment. So I realized I could get all the benefits without jumping into the stream. I originally wanted to jump in the stream and change it. Now I'm taking pieces from the stream. I'm analyzing them with AI and open CV and everything. And then I'm using them to create either indications or directions or, um, you know, it could be audio description of what I should do. So that, that was a huge uh, evolution of getting away from, you know, first it was just going to be a screen, like you said. Then it was going to be improve the whole screen, you know, take it from the stream, put it back in the stream. That, but now, now I've settled to, with AI, with this uh, type of technology that's available today, you can kind of do a hybrid solution that solves all problems. Interesting. So it sounds like Unity provides a way to abstract images coming from the external cameras? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so actually the links uh, and all these devices, they build uh, APIs that uh, will like make it so you can like pull the picture from the left and right camera from the stream. I use that with OpenCV to identify all the objects that are there. And then I use depth to figure out how far away they are. And then I present it. So what comes up, you know, totally independent of the stream and whatever I can see from the stream, these objects are now out in space and represent what it's discovered. And I mean, the sky's the limit of what you could do now. You can get whatever you want from the visual stream, but you can also take it and create all new things that are now virtual environments uh, right. within, within Unity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last question I have is, um, are you able to play um, games that are, I guess, a range of games that are developed for people with normal vision um, or are they kind of impossible for you to play them? In? If there are any that you do play, like which ones do you enjoy? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the a year ago, I stopped playing. I was friends, a group of friends that I play. We would play um, Call of Duty, and I was terrible because obviously I couldn't see anything. I had the donut and everything. I mean, the first time I would find out, like we'd play zombie mode. And the first time I'd find out something was happening was the first hit. Like uh, the first hit was always gone for me because that was when I realized, you know, I'd, I'd feel for the vibration of which side it was on and then I'll know someone's near me. So it was pretty bad. I was terrible, but it was fun. I could do it enough. And then my vision has gone down again over the last year and I have not been able to play. Uh, so I used to really enjoy um, you know, being on a team of people and all four of us working towards a goal or whatever. And, and I'm hoping that the XR technology is eventually going to bring that back again, you know, potentially with brighter screens, haptic feedback. I see it, you know, a lot of the videos that are out there, nothing to do with vision, nothing to do with low vision or anything, but they're showing, you know, chairs you can sit in that, that make you feel like you're in an airplane and, and suits you can wear or vests you can wear that makes it feel like, you know, you got hit. Um, I really think that eventually I'm going to be able to get back into it. And I do really, I do really enjoy it. I think it's a fun way to interact with people. And if the technology can even the playing field to where I could actually function, you know, I, that would be great too. But I, I have learned to, you know, lose every, lose every game. <laughs> yeah. I mean, some people use the, um, devices, not so much even for the visual field. Uh, like some people go into VR chat in order mm -hmm. to play take naps together so they're like yeah. sleeping, um, virtually sleeping, sleeping together so they're not even like using the vision but i think there's some spatial audio and it's just that maybe some have to feed feedback or having the sense that you, you know you're in this virtual space with each other so it's kind yeah, of I'm taking notes from all of you all your great questions and comments and uh, that's definitely another one i'll follow up on i, I really appreciate it thank you you're welcome yeah, I do think that all the headset and uh, when design, because my background is designer, uh, we really need to uh, kind of um, do the accessibility because um, just like uh, I, I usually said, uh, refer Amy Lanier, she said that there are three C's for, uh, for uh, XR to rock uh, to, to solve three C's problem. One is cost. Another mm -hmm. one is comfort. The other one is content. So I think what Chris present today is about comfort for low vision or people um, with like a, some blind, uh, some colorblind or other uh, eye um, kind of like a 
most people like helping them to access uh, XR. And also I learned a lot from Chris. I start thinking about, is there any way that we can kind of do something? And also I think, for example, like a Vision Pro, I tried Vision Pro three times. Um, yeah, yesterday was my third time uh, in Apple's headquarter. Um, and uh, I do notice that Apple do uh, take care of all those vision at the beginning, right, of the process. Uh, mm -hmm. But I do think that um, see, and, and I saw, uh, Chris, you uh, personally, you also code and um, create a lot of apps to help people with low vision um, accessibilities. And I do think that there will be, uh, what I'm thinking is that maybe there's a hackathon or uh, there's a um, workshop to kind of like teach people how to uh, make your game or make your device um, to do uh, those types of assist to uh, people who need uh, those types of assist. That's that's in my head. Yeah. I think that's a great idea. And, you know, I'm going to see reality hack out of 200 teams, like 10 of them uh, did low vision work. I think a lot of it was because I was there and talking about it. And so it kind of sparked a lot of ideas and two of them won top prizes. So I would, I would love that. I would do any hackathon, anybody that wants to pull people together, they want to make the world a better place, yet use XR and cool technologies. Um, that, that would be great. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely, because right now we are in the middle process um, of, of some uh, participants. So yeah, definitely I will loop in and see how how creative or how good we can to help um, create, sparkle some ideas that helps people with uh, uh, low vision. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions last minute? I know we have like a 30 minutes uh, extend and I really appreciate Chris. It's like, uh, wow, you are, I mean, I, I, it's like open my eyes to see all those like a uh, device because I didn't even realize that those like a uh, computer vision or mixed reality headset can really change a person with low vision's life. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you for the discussion. I really appreciate everybody's time. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank and, you. And Chris, if you like, I have an idea for your, your game um, issue. If you want to hang on, I'll just pitch an idea about that. Great. That sounds awesome. I'll, I'll just say it now. And I, you want to end the meeting, that's fine. Yeah. Do, you, do you want me to just pitch it? OK. Yeah, so, no, just pitch it. Yeah. Uh, OK, so um, pitching an idea for the solution for your game that you mentioned that you get shut down quickly. What game was that? Uh, Call of Duty. Call of Duty. OK, I haven't played that game, but it reminds me um, I have an idea that there's a true story of um, a incident that happened in World War II, where the Germans and the, and the, another, um, and the Allies had a ceasefire at Christmas. Um, and it's a famous movie um, after um, a Christmas uh, song of some type. And they had a ceasefire for about three days, um, but um, and they actually ended up playing a game of soccer between them at, at because things just got so relaxed, um, and then that ended. But there was one element that went between the two sides, and that was a cat. They okay. each group tried to entice the cat to come to their side, and they'd feed the cat, and then the cat would go to the other side, and they'd be like, "Oh no, don't leave us!" You know, so each group was enticing the cat to go back and forth. So, what if you were instead of a player to be shot down, a player that was desired? They tried to entice you to come to their side, and they might get extra points, or then, or you go to the other side, and they get extra points. So, there's a um, a reward benefit. To, for you to choose which side you're going to go to. That's a, that's a great idea. That's very creative. I mean, it's uh, the only I've ever heard anybody, you know, I, I think as we get more of these social games, like how I was talking about, um, I, I think, you know, if people are taking naps together, then probably they, you know, having games like that, I think it'd be really, really awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Wow, yeah, thank you so much. And um, I will see you next week. I think next week okay. is uh, The Void, right? Uh, uh, Curtis, um, um, uh, like talking about hyper reality uh, experience. So yeah, stay tuned. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank uh, you very much. Well, we'll think after. Yeah, bye-bye.